Hello everybody and welcome back to another video in Geography 340 Climatology. I am Dr. Zach Hilgendorf and today we're going to be talking about ice core dating. This is a really, really cool method, uh, kind of continuing what we've been talking about, about paleoclimate proxy data that we can use. I'm also going to post a, uh, a well, no, it's not going to be supplemental. It's going to be one that I would invite you to watch um, because it's just going to do what I'm doing, but probably better. And they were actually at the labs with the people doing the ice core dating and using the ice cores to date things. I'm really I'm going to invite you to watch it. Um, there will likely be some a test question on it. It'll be posted in our week 14 module, um, but it's by Dr. Johansson at the Be Smart uh, YouTube group with PBS St uh, Digital Studios. Fantastic uh, piece of science communication on ice core dating. So uh, look for that. Uh, but we're going to get started on this video. So in this one, we're talking about ice cores, uh, which can preserve paleoclimate indicators corresponding to the time of deposition of the snow. Here are just a few of the places that ice cores have been pulled from. Uh, all over Greenland and Alaska, uh, Chile and Peru, Antarctica, Kilimanjaro, wherever you have ice caps or glaciers, you can try and get at uh, what these ice cores are and, and the paleoclimate records that they preserve. So why do we look at ice cores? Well, ice cores are among the few naturally occurring climate archives. Seasonal temperature variations uh, basically are exhibited as pronounced layering in an annual fashion. So you can see it almost looks like layers or horizontal bars in that uh, thing to, or the, the ice wall to our left here. So you can kind of see if we look at this ridge here, we've got here, here, all these depositional layers that, that are recording annual cycles of precipitation. Ice sheets have the potential pr to preserve paleoclimate indicators corresponding to the time of deposition. And to date, ice cores have yielded reliable data back to 800,000 years into the past. How? Because that is a fantastic and incredible record. Bubbles, little tiny bubbles. Air bubbles in the ice trap pollen and the atmosphere, which is made of gas. And if we know the distribution of those things like oxygen isotopes, we can get an idea of the depositional climate uh, of what that climate was like thousands of years ago. So in the ice, water molecules or H2O have oxygen atoms of different isotopes. The ratio of the amount of one oxygen isotope to another oxygen isotope is used as a proxy for temperature. Scientists can measure the isotope ratio of the ice to determine past temperatures. Pollen and dust particles are also used to infer more about the conditions at that time. There are gas bubbles trapped in the ice. These, the gases can be analyzed to determine the amount of greenhouse gases that were present in the atmosphere long ago. Uh, if we think back a couple of slides ago to our, or a couple of um, lectures ago to our natural climate drivers, things like carbon dioxide and the a percentage of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the air can infer how much of that is sunk or how much of that is available to the atmosphere. And from that, we can determine glacial or interglacial periods and how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. And these are very, very tiny little bubbles. We can see here they basically are compressed over you know, layers and layers of snow and ice uh, that form trapping these bubbles, like you can see here or here or here. All of these bubbles are records of the past and of climates in the past. And this environmental data can include temperature. Uh, we get that through looking at oxygen 18 or helium 2, it's different isotope ratios, uh, atmospheric chemistry by analyzing what's in those bubbles net accumulation of snow and ice, dustiness of the atmosphere, how much sediment is moving about and being blown about, uh, saying how much vegetation might be on the surface, uh, keeping that dust down or allowing it to blow. Changes in vegetation, volcanic history, if there's things like tephra or ash being distributed about the atmosphere, they'll be captured in these little bubbles. Uh, anthropogenic emissions, like us, uh, and entrapped microorganisms. Here we can look at uh, these isotopes, dust, uh, 
anions and cations, and the rest of it is kind of kept as an archive of the varves or layers of the ice cores. And this is what one of those laboratories looks like. These are uh, some slides that were uh, used from some folks at Ohio State University. So you see the uh, bpcrc.osu.edu. These are from the OSU website. So how do you date ice cores? Well, it's kind of like dendrochronology. Uh, if we line these up, it's actually kind of astounding how much like dendrochronology it is because instead of looking horizontally as the tree grows out, we're looking vertically as the ice is deposited on top. So here, ice cores are like tree rings. Summer ice appears light, winter ice appears dark. So you can count how many years you see, uh, just like you would the rings of a tree. And that rhymed and I didn't even try to do it. Uh, but summer bands appear white because snow experiences 24 hours of sunlight in the polar region. This changes the texture of the snow compared to the zero hours of sunlight received in the winter. Um, so things might melt and compress more rapidly than they would in you know, the summer than they would in the winter. Here we can see, uh, for example, this ice core shows 12 different years of deposition. And you can count it by those arrows that you see on the top just to get an idea of these light and dark uh, relationships are just like we see with the early wood and dark wood growth on a tree ring. So the structure of these ideal ice cores for long time scales, we're looking at ice sheet flow that's dominated by gravitational forces. This gets us in the thousands to almost millions of years into the past. Uh, these are ideal archiving core sites. They're referred to as domes. Uh, these are regions where gravity acts only in the Z direction. And by Z, we mean down. It's only compressing things. The resulting layers flow radially out from the dome over time, thinning as they go towards the edges of this dome. Right in the center of that dome is the preserved portions that we're looking for. Things like the Greenland and Antarctica ice sheets are perfect examples of these ice sheets or ice domes that we can use for these types of uh, ice core dating strategies. Short time scales, uh, there are three primary structures. So snow cover results from precipitation and wind currents. Uh, over time, older snow layers compact to form fern, what we call fern, kind of this compressed snow. Uh, over time, old, or, uh, sorry, after sufficient burial, ice begins to form due to the compression uh, because as you are compressing, as there's more weight above you, it will warm and compress and form ice and it's considered to be isolated from the atmosphere at that point. And ice can be isolated with relic atmospheric air or something called clathrates in it. In the geographic context, ice cores have been collected from a variety of glaciated locations. These regions primarily consist of the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. Secondary regions include tropical glaciers like the Andes in South America uh, and other land glaciers like Northern Canada. One of the most famous and one of the most incredible is the Vostok dome or the Vostok uh, core. You see I circled right here. Uh, in past videos, we've looked at the uh, EPICA dome, dome C right here, nearby to the Vostok dome, uh, domes. We'll talk about that here in the next few slides. First off, how did we get to Antarctica and why are we getting ice there? Well. The first notable attempts to probe the ice sheet was by Ernst Sorge in 1930, or in the 1930s. Uh, his findings were published in 1935, showing ice density increased as a function of depth. It wasn't until 20 years later that the ice cores were starting to be grabbed. Quickly, this became an international effort with the United States and Europe confined to the Arctic regions, whereas the Russians were coring at things like the Vostok core site. Um, they were the first in Antarctica with a 377 meter core sampled in 1959. The early 1960s were an innovative time for ice core collection. Sites were reaching depths on the order of several kilometers in this decade. Major inhibitors included drill capabilities, site accessibility, and bedrock depth. Publications in 1953 and 64 established the link between isotopic composition of snow and the temperature of the precipitation at the site. This is a really, really important uh, link to be made because it allowed us to be able to take those bubbles 
look at the isotopic ratios within them and understand the depositional climates that they were formed during. So things like isotopic uh, deuterium or deuterium and uh, oxygen or isotope 18 for oxygen ratios in snow were an effective proxy for finding atmospheric temperatures over periods of snow deposition. Oxygen is one of the most significant keys to deciphering past climates. Oxygen comes in heavy and light uh, varieties or isotopes, which are useful for these paleoclimate reconstructions. Like all elements, oxygen is made up of a nucleus, protons, and neutrons surrounded by a cloud of electrons. All oxygen atoms have eight protons, but that nucleus might have eight, nine, or 10 neutrons. Light oxygen, or oxygen 16 with eight protons and eight neutrons, is the most common isotope found in nature, followed by the much lesser amounts of heavy, or oxygen 18, with eight protons and 10 neutrons. That ratio or relative amount of these two types of oxygen in water changes with the climate. By determining how the ratio of heavy and light oxygen in marine sediments, ice cores, and fossils is different from the universally accepted standards, we can learn something about climate changes that have happened in the past. The standard scientists use for comparisons is based on the ratio of oxygen isotopes in ocean waters at a depth of 200 to 500 meters. We also use it in ice cores. The early 1970s marked the start of drilling at the Vostok site in Antarctica. Over decades, the Vostok site continued to grow in depth and is now the deepest ice core site, over three and a half kilometers into the subsurface and into this ice sheet. Research has continued in the Vostok site with the penetration on Lake Vostok in uh, 2012, this is kind of a subsurface lake area. First example of the ideal dome drilling was at the inland site of Dome C, which we've looked at before. Initial depth of Dome C was at 905 meters into the subsurface. Drilling at this site progressed until bedrock was hit in 2005 at a depth of 3,620 meters, just three shy of the one at the Vostok site. Dome C has provided scientists with an analog of paleoclimate indicators for the past 800,000 years. So where to look for ice core data? Well, we look in isolated air pockets within the glacial ice preserves, uh, because that preserves the dominant depositional atmosphere. Ice without bubbles uh, melting may contain air clathrates. Impurities within the ice act as markers for climate cycles and events. Lower layers contain older records, but with reduced resolution. And then accreted layers above glacial lakes uh, can basically infer on these constant isotopes and gases within the subsurface. Ice core interpretation. So we look for isotopic properties that infer atmospheric composition, oxygen 16 and 18, uh, deuterium, carbon 14, beryllium 10, and lead 207. Uh, unique chemical signatures like sea salt and biological sequences, and then atmospheric records like uh, wind and partial oxygen pressure. Isotopes 16, 17, and H2, due to the linear relationship between uh, the isotopic deuterium and uh, oxygen 18, both isotopes are precipitation and temperature analogs. Recently applied over long time intervals, we can get that record back to 800,000 years before the present. We see such a thing uh, in this figure on the right-hand side here. Recent research suggests that these three isotopes can be used to infer humidity as well. That's interesting and fascinating research coming up. These figures show uh, deuterium variations, which are very closely linked to greenhouse gas concentrations. Isotopic C14, entrapped, within, uh, entrapped air within ice, has been a great scientific interest since the 1960s. We've got C14 dating and atmospheric carbon dioxide took over a decade to measure reliably. So carbon dioxide data from Dome C showed that carbon dioxide concentrations were about 30 degrees lower during the last glacial maximum. Among the first major uh, forms of evidence to support the claims made by uh, Arrhenius at the end of the 19th century, these changes in climate can be used as a proxy for cosmic radiation or radionuclide dating, and other greenhouse gases have been heavily studied in ice cores, including ethane, methane, and nitrous oxide. The isotope beryllium-10, similar to carbon-14, beryllium-10 is a radionuclei that can be found in ice cores. 
Uh, the majority of cosmic rays reaching Earth are from supernova explosions outside of our solar system. But cosmic rays are mitigated by the solar magnetic field and geomagnetic field. Until recent research into beryllium-10, cosmic radiation was only recorded to the 1930s using ionization chambers and neutron monitors. Using beryllium-10 as a cosmic radiation proxy has extended this archive to 9.4 thousand years in the past. We get beryllium-10 and carbon-14 together. Both radionuclides are produced via nuclear reaction uh, with cosmic rays and atmospheric nitrogen and oxygen. C14 is less effective solar radiation proxy as it enters the carbon cycle, which is already enriched with C14. But we can use these for these proxies on solar energy. Uh, beryllium-10, however, is an aerosol-borne isotope with a short atmospheric residence time. The findings show huge discrepancies between modern solar radiation and past solar radiation. For lead 207, scientists have looked to ice cores for evidence of lead pollution from 20th century mining efforts. Uh, lead isotope data was recorded at, law, at the Law Dome uh, from 1500 to 1989 AD. Articles in the early 2000s concluded that major lead pollution event was observed right at the peak of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this spike in anthropogenic lead was attributed to mining at Broken Hill and Port Piri, Australia. The sparsity of data doesn't allow for conclusions to be drawn regarding transport to Antarctica, however. Chemical signatures, we can look at things like sea ice proxies. So to quantify uh, climate modeling, we need to look at these quantifying these past sea ice extents. Recent research identified proxies within sea ice cores. Unlike traditional ice cores, like these dome-oriented long cores, coastal regions are drilled to find ice extent proxies. Antarctica is an ideal site for observing this because Antarctic ice cores only contain sea ice information if it can be transported there by the atmosphere. As sea ice, uh, or as ice extent increases, sea ice surface area increases as well uh, as the distance required for aerosol transport. So we look at these kind of two dominant theories of sea salt transport. Frost flowers, so delicate crystals that form with new sea ice. As brine wicks up, the fresh frost flowers have a rather high salinity. The frost flowers are mobile, but are related to seasonal variations in ice formations. And uh, Abram et al. 2013 suggests that little seasonal contrast in sodium flux, which undermines this theory, so there's some issues with it. And then salty blowing snow. So salty blowing snow is a theory which works on the assumption that snow on sea ice is higher in salinity. Strong winds have the ability to mobilize snow in the Antarctic interior. And then the sublimation of this snow should result in sea ice aerosols, or sea salt aerosols, pardon me, uh, which are entrapped in glacial ice. Results from various ice core data sets show strong correlation between sea salt and temperature and ice presence. The, temp or the mechanism of salt transport must be further constrained in order to model sea ice extent with reasonable accuracy, which would tell us how much water was available and what uh, perhaps what things like sea levels were at the time. So using aerosols as an ice extent proxy is a challenge in and of itself due to the extreme variability of wind cycles over long periods of time. But there is some promise and, and interesting results that are coming from this. Definitely would suggest you to look at this site or to look at this paper, a new Greenland ice core chronology for the last glacial termination. Um, kind of real application on how we use these ice core data to extend our record back. Uh, here, looking at the last glacial maximum and the end of the last glacial uh, epoch, Lake Wisconsin and glaciation. So uh, make sure you look back at the week 14 module because I will be posting the uh, other video I need you to watch by Johansson, or Dr. Johansson at the Be Smart organization, or uh, YouTube page. So go check those out uh, and watch that. There will be a question or two on the exam related to the methodology that he talks about. Um, and I do it much more succinctly than I do. Uh, it's probably one of the more uh, impressive videos that I've watched from that crew. So here are the references. Uh, if you wanna go check any of those out, here are some more as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And the last one, we're going to be talking about lake cores and pollen data. Uh, so that's kind of the last paleoclimate proxy that we're going to talk about, but another fascinating one. So we'll see you in the next video and have a great day.